This is Dr. Jonathan Hansen. I'm the president of World Ministries International and Eagle Saving Nations. You're watching and listening to The Warning Program. It's a live audience, children present. I'm going to talk a little bit today about the story, the story of Purim. The story of Purim. If you have your Bibles, you could read Esther 1, 1 through 22. The story of Purim. And the Jews will be celebrating that story. They sell it, celebrate it every year on March 23. Now, in this time of uncertainty, we need to remember the story of Esther. We're living in uncertain times right now. How could God use a stepfather figure, a young Jewish girl, and a pagan enemy king? Now the truth is God can use anybody who is willing to do his will. It doesn't matter how dire and hopeless it appears to be. We must keep the faith. Now Mordecai kept the faith. Queen Esther kept the faith. The enemy's heart was touched. God's people were saved. And the person who plotted to destroy God's people was killed. So we're living today as Christians in very dangerous times where people are demonically inspired as Haman to hate believers. Look at Hamas. Hating believers and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. First the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. They hate the Christians, they hate the Jews. Say they're going to wipe out the Jews, then the Christians. Turn down a two... State solution five times. They want no peace. They hate. Because Satan hates the people of God. Satan hates the people of God. So the story of Purim is a story of faith and victory. Now, one, Purim is a festive Jewish holiday that celebrates the deliverance of Jews from imminent doom at the hands of their enemies in the biblical book of Esther. Perm is celebrated on the 14th day of the Hebrew month of Adar, or in the case of a Jewish leap year. Perm Ketan is celebrated in Adar 1, and regular Purim is celebrated in Adar 2. So Purim is so called because of the Villain of the story, Amen. Cast the pur, meaning lot, against the Jews, yet failed to destroy them. Again, Purim, a festive Jewish holiday. But it has meaning for all of us. The story of Purim, celebrated on the biblical book of Esther, which recounts the story of Queen Esther and how she saved the Jewish people from annihilation. The story begins when the king wanted his wife, Queen Vashti, to appear before him in his party guest. She refused. And as a result, the king decides to find another queen. His search begins with a royal beauty pageant in which the most beautiful young women in the kingdom are brought before the king and Esther, a young Jewish girl, is selected to be the new queen. Now God can use a person in a beauty contest. He can use a man's lust to accomplish his will. God can use anything and he will use whatever is available. Esther is portrayed as an orphan belonging to the tribe of Benjamin. She lives with her cousin Mordecai as a member of the Jewish exiles in Persia. At her cousin's behest, Esther conceals her Jewish identity from the king. Now, Mordecai is often portrayed as Esther's uncle, Esther 2.15. 
offers Esther's lineage as Esther, the daughter of, I'll spell it A-V-I-C-H-A-Y-I-L, Mordecai's uncle. Now, Haman represents, if we want to give some typology here, Haman represents the devil. Mordecai could represent the Messiah. And the Jews, the people of God, or the bride of Christ. And Esther was a savior. All of us can rise up and be ambassadors and help save a community, a state, a nation. So not long after Esther becomes a queen, Mordecai off offends the grand vizar, Haman, by refusing to bow down to him. Now, Haman had, a, obviously, a lot of pride. Uh, people used by Satan have a lot of pride. If you're not covered under the blood, definitely have a lot of pride. Even if you are covered under the blood, you could have a lot of pride. Especially if you let it manifest. You have to control your temper. How much do you spend time with the Holy Ghost? Can you daily control that thing? Can you control it hourly, moment by moment? Pride is something that means we're alive, but it's also something that gets us into trouble if it's not under the blood. Our flesh gets us in trouble. So, Haman decides to punish not only Mordecai, but all the Jews. So Satan wants to punish not only the Messiah, he wants to kill off the bride of Christ. That's what he's trying to do. That's what he's trying to do today. Trying to attack, not only take God out of every nation or out of, right now we live in America, take God out of America. The Republic means under God. Every nation, take God out of it. And then wipe out God's people. That's what's happening in nation after nation today. Again, it should be a warning what a person's pride is capable of doing, even against the innocent family and friends of a person they hate. Like those Christians in Germany who turned in their fellow Germans who protected the Jews and were against Hitler and the Nazis. That's what man is capable of doing. Turn against their fellow men. So here, we said Haman, Mordecai, wouldn't bow to Haman, and by refusing to bow down to him, Haman decides to punish not only Mordecai, representing the Messiah, but all the Jews, all of them, for this offense. He informs the king that if the Jews do not obey the king's laws, it would be in the king's kingdom's best interest to get rid of them. How does that apply to the bride of Christ today? Well, a lot of the enemies of God, if we say, you know, the Christians are the cancer, they're stopping this new world order, they're against what we, what we want to accomplish, and so they want to get rid of us. Today, we are the enemy. The people of God has always been the enemy. Again, Haman, it would be in the kingdom's best interest to get rid of them. It would be in America's best interest to get rid of the Christians, what some liberals would be saying. Especially behind closed doors. He asked for permission to destroy them, which the king grants. Haman then orders the king's officials to kill all the Jews, young and old and children, on the 13th day of the month of Adar, Esther 3.13. <coughs> when Mordecai learns of the plot, he tears his clothes. In other words, fast, prays, wails, 
cries in public. He sits in sackcloth and ashes at the entrance of the city. When Esther learns of this, she orders one of her servants to find out what's troubling her cousin, her uncle. The servant returns to Esther with a copy of the edict and instructs instructions from Mordecai that she should beg the king for mercy on her people. It's not a simple request. As it's been 30 days since the king had summoned Esther, and appearing before him without summons was punishable by death. So Mordecai urges her to take action anyway, put her life on the line, saying that perhaps she became a queen so that she could save her people. Esther decides to fast before taking action. She wants to really have the strength to do it. She wants to make sure that God is with her. So she requests her fellow Jews to fast along with her during this time of sincere fasting and praying. One of the requests I'm sure she's making is grant us favor. Touch the heart. I'm going to go before he has called me. Let me not be killed. And this is where the minor feast of Esther comes from. Again, fellow Jews fast along with her. So Esther appeals to the king. We must appeal to our king for strategy. She appealed to the king. She fasted and prayed. She got strategy. After fasting for three days, Esther puts on her finest clothes, appears before the king. He is pleased to see her and ask what she desires. She replies that she would be like the king and Haman to join her at a banquet. So she wants the king and Haman to join her at a banquet. Haman's delighted to hear this, but is so upset still with Mordecai that he can't stop thinking about it. His wife and friends tell him to impale Mordecai. Impale him on a pole. It will make him feel better. I wonder what the enemies of the church want to do to us. What are they plotting? What do they plot in Germany? Dehumanize, concentration camp, and death. However, that night, the king decides to honor Mordecai because earlier in the story, Mordecai had uncovered a plot against the king. So you see how all of this goes and how the Holy Spirit uses Mordecai's past to bring favor in the future. He commands Haman to put the king's own robe on Mordecai and to take him around the city on the king's horse with proclaiming, this is what is done for the man, the king's delight to honor, Esther 6.11. Haman reluctantly obeys and soon after goes to Esther's banquet. You know, the, the, again, Haman representing Satan. Satan reluctantly obeys as far as can't do anything at time to us because God is with us. He protects us. His angels are around us. His blood is over us. He grants us favor. And our enemies don't have the authority then to destroy us. At the banquet, the king asks his wife again, what does she desire? In other words, what do you want? If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life, this is my petition. Spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed killed and annihilated, Esther 7, 3. The king is outraged. 
that anyone would dare to threaten his queen. And when he asks who has done such a thing, Esther declares that Haman is to blame. One of Esther's servants then tells the king that Haman had erected a pole upon which he planned to impale Mordecai. Again, Mordecai representing the Messiah, Haman representing Satan. Satan wants to destroy the Messiah, Jesus. He causes him to be crucified, but in the end, our Messiah throws Satan into the bottomless pit. Okay, so you can see how this is working. He takes his signet ring from Haman, gives it to Mordecai, who is also given Haman's estate. Because now the king has commands that Haman is impaled. Then the king gives Esther the power to overturn Haman's orders. The Jews celebrate victory. Esther issuing an edict, edict giving Jews in every city the right to assemble and to protect themselves. To protect themselves against anyone who would try to harm them. When the appointed day arrives, the Jews defend themselves against their attackers, killing and destroying them. According to the book of Esther, this happened on the 13th of Adar. And on the 14th day, the Jews rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. Esther 9.18. So Mordecai declares that victory is remembered every year. And celebration is called Purim. Because Haman cast the Pur, meaning lot, against the Jews. Yet failed to destroy them. How many people are casting their lot, plotting, planning, pushing politics, laws, their agenda, to destroy the church, to take away our rights, to take away our freedoms, removing God out of the republic, or out of the nation you live, wherever you live around the world. The enemies of God, under Haman or Satan, are trying to take away your rights, trying to destroy you. Stop your influence in the nation because only you can prevent a new world order. If we can have a great awakening, if you can rise up with the power of the Holy Ghost and lead a mighty revival, that's what Eagle Saving Nations is all about. We're trying to do it in every nation on earth. Every nation on earth. Have the people of God, we want to assemble them into the stadiums. Let the power of God come down like Pentecost. If you have a website, computer, go to my website, worldministries.org, worldministries.org. That's worldministries.org. Join Eagle Saving Nations. We need to have a plan in your nation. You know what's going on in your nation. You know how they're trying to topple your nation. You know how they're trying to topple your economy. Destroy your sovereignty by destroying your borders. Move you into a new world order. Only the church can stop this. The Bible is so clear. Some Nations will be sheep nations will come under the Lord Jesus Christ during this horrific time we're living in the f and into the future, the great tribulation. They'll be called the sheep nation, some a goat nation, cooperating with the new world order. Most will cooperate. If your nation cooperates, you as Christians will be the evil ones. They'll demonize you. Take away your rights. You'll either take the mark so you can buy or sell or they'll kill you. This is what is coming. This is what they're planning right now. There is nothing in this life that is impossible to face. Nothing 
we cannot go to our King Jesus for his strategy to defeat the enemies of God. Mordecai and Esther fasted and prayed for a plan to give them a way of escape. For a plan, we can go to God. And we're doing that in every nation. God gave us your strategy. How the church can rise up, lead another great awakening. Lead a national repentance. Come under your morality and laws again. Put in righteous leaders. If the righteous lead, the people prosper. If evil men lead, the people suffer. We've got to put in righteous leaders in every nation. I just came from Colombia. I had prophesied five years ago. It came to pass. They have a communist president. They have to rise up, put in a righteous leader again. Or they're going to lose their freedoms forever. Mordecai fasted with Esther and prayed. They wanted God's plan to give them a way of escape. We need to do the same. You need to do the same no matter what nation you live in. To give them deliverance from the evil Haman or Satan that was organizing squads of death to kill not only Mordecai, but the people of God. Squads of death all over the world. Communists have done this. Presidents who are dictators have done this. Hitler did this. To eradicate anybody that gets in their way. We need to fast and pray for strategy, for a plan. No matter what nation you live in. God, through the fasting and praying of Mordecai, Esther, and the Hebrews, softened the heart of the king. Through fasting and prayer, getting a plan from God. How to deal with the king. Fasting and prayer alone doesn't save a nation. It gives you God's strategy and gives you God's strength to carry out the plan. We are his ambassadors. People have tried to just take the place, let God take their place of responsibility. Let's just pray and let God deal with it. God's not going to deal with it just by praying. He'll give you strategy, he'll give you a plan, he'll give you strength, and you have to be his ambassador. Every person in the Bible that stood in the gap, every single one of them, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, all of them that stood in the gap, Elijah, Elisha, Ezekiel, they all went into slavery anyway. Standing in the gap did not prevent slavery of the nation. They had, they had to leave a national revival and it never happened. The only thing that ever stopped it was repentance at Nineveh. hundred years later, the people in Nineveh returned to their evil ways and then God destroyed them. See, prayer alone cannot save a nation. You have to be Christ's ambassadors. You have to preach the gospel. People have to repent or judgment falls. They fasted, they prayed, they had a plan. And through their plan and through their strategy and through their talking to the king, his heart was softened. Haman himself was executed on his own gallows. And God's people were able to defend themselves against Haman's death squads. It's like the American Revolution. The pastors rose up. Pastors took off their robes, grabbed their muskets, became the officers in the American Revolution, and led freedom. We defended the cause of Christ. We defended our freedom. There is justifiable self-defense. There's justifiable joining the army. There's justifiable law enforcement. All through the Bible, it's justified to defend yourself. All through the Bible, God used armies to carry out His purpose. All through the Bible, that's where our morality and laws, including the courts, 
and the prisons came from. It was from the Bible, study. It went into even lengths of terms, sentences, or execution. It's all there. Haman himself was executed on his own gallows, and God's people were able to defend himself against murderous death squads. We can defend ourselves today. We can defend ourselves today. We can be victorious today. They defended themselves. They ended up living in prosperity and freedom. That's what happened. So can we today. I think that this story of Purim, of Esther, of Haman, of the king, how God preserved them is a tremendous, tremendous story for us today. It's a story that they remember, the Jews, the Hebrews, their history, whether they're still around. But it's also a story for the Bride of Christ to remember. Because what he did for them, he still can do today. How he can save. How he can deliver. How instead of death we can prosper. So I think this is all so very important. This is something that we need to understand. What went involved? What happened? What did they do to bring their victory instead of their extermination? They just didn't rush into it. They fasted, they prayed, they got God's strategy, and then they had to take action. They had to put their life on the line. Esther put her life on the line. It's not like a wife today who can mouth off to her husband. Boy, he'll kill you. He'll kill you if you walk in without being summoned. Might be a good warning, huh, to everybody. You return back to those days and I don't think you mouth off too much. Her life was on the line, but with God's strength, after fasting and prayed, praying, she had the courage then to put her life on the line whether she lived or died. And that's what we need today. Ladies and gentlemen, join Eagle Saving Nations. Please go to my website worldministries.org, that is worldministries.org, worldministries.org. Go to my website, join Eagle Saving Nations. My phone number, 360-629-5248, 360-629-5248, You can give us money to help us to continue with this program and sound the alarm so we don't come under slavery. PayPal on my website, zell at warning at worldministries.org, warning at worldministries.org. God bless you.